It's an interesting question, and I love the way you worded it, because when I first got sober, I had people asking me, and I still meet new people every single day, and it happens less and less, and so I've become more in tune with like things like mindset and all of that in my recovery. Oftentimes, it is very much the people around you are matching your energy or that you're vibing with something with them, and they know kind of that you might want it, because when I first started, and Oftentimes, like, I, if I was thinking about that drink, people would be asking me about that drink. Welcome to Mamwa. I'm Gord de Camp, your host, and this is the podcast that includes you into my most famous song lyrics. He's a middle-aged man with an attitude, and he didn't even have one till he met you. That's right, I'm the middle-aged man, and my attitude will chatter us through all things that I'm passionate about. From spirituality, the gym and fitness, food, traveling, and music or movies. Quick disclaimer, this list is not exhaustive. So you can get on or you can get off and join us for the episodes that you like the sounds of. Dip in or dip out, as long as you keep dipping. Either way, we've got something to say and we're going in three, two... One thing we don't hear much of these days is sobriety or teetotalers as we would call it in the UK. And especially with people like myself from Scotland, we're quite well known for our love of addictions. Because of this, I'm really looking forward to today's chat. Do we not talk about our relationships with addictions, or is there a generational change and maybe there's less of them? To help us get into it, we are joined today by Steve, who you guys would have heard from from a Gay A podcast. How are you today, Steve? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Not a problem at all. Thank you for joining us. I'm really looking forward to this. So um, in the gay community, I know over here, the lifestyle lends a lot to drinking. Um, I've been a victim to it myself. And by the sounds of some of the shows that you've had each week on the podcast, you've got a lot that we can discuss today as well. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. So if we get right into it, um, I thought, let's talk firstly about sobriety. So what's, what's your background on sobriety and kind of where did that come from in regards to starting the podcast? Yeah, well, sure. Uh, my sobriety started when I realized that I was an alcoholic. And from there, any other drugs sounded great to me. Once I had my first drink, there was no saying no to anything after that. But that I had that realization after 34 years almost of trying to fight it or it, pretend it wasn't a problem or that I didn't have a problem. I honestly, I would say I thought for the f- most of my life that I was normal and that we all were having the same mental gymnastics and struggles and obsessions yeah. and constantly thinking about alcohol the way that I was. It was only when it, as they say, like it s- starts with being fun with a little bit of like, you know, just fun. Then it's fun with a little bit of problems. Then it's more problems with less fun, and then it's all problems. And it was only when it was getting to the point where it was all problems and I wasn't having fun anymore, yeah. where I wasn't drinking to relax after a hard day's work. I wasn't drinking to celebrate with friends. I was drinking because I had to keep drinking because I didn't know how to function in this world sober. And that was when I started getting a real spiritual rock bottom, where I always wasn't... I wasn't very familiar with the whole 12 step program. I know I went to some meetings when I was forced to, when I was in my early twenties for a DUI, but it was like not even in one ear and out the other. There was like a steel plate around my head where it didn't even go through it. It just went around it. I was not ready to listen. The moment that I heard that they weren't teaching me how to get away with drinking and driving next time I tuned it all out. And so I didn't know what programs were, but I knew that everything about gay culture, queer culture was surrounded by going to bars or it was happy hours or this or that, but it was always something with alcohol, even the sports leagues and things like that. There was always like jello shots and drinks after the games and there's alcohol everywhere normally, but like you add in the queer culture and it was special with the way that you would see it portrayed in like movies and TV shows. It was just there. I didn't think there was another way. So I was like, okay, well, I have to live this way because there's no other option, but I was not having fun anymore. And I was you know, on, on paper, I still had my house. I still had my relationship. I still had my job. So I kept on saying, well, I can't be a real alcoholic because I have all these things. Meanwhile, I was like waking up every morning upset that I didn't have an aneurysm in my sleep because I just wanted to die to stop this process from repeating itself. And then I had to spend the first like 15, 20 minutes looking through my phone being like, what happened last night? And that was the daily occurrence for months before I finally 
decided to try sobriety. And from there, I was like, well, this is much better than that misery. And I never looked back. I mean, I've looked back, but, you know, to reflect, not to, not to, not wistfully anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, like for, for me, I've been from Scotland. We just drink anyway. Um, mm-hmm. And it's quite a daily thing. So even when I was like 18, 19, like I didn't come out until I was in my early 20s. So mm-hmm. like I was straight until I was in my early 20s. But I was I was a drinker anyway. But drinking wasn't partying. It was just going to the pub after work, having a few drinks mm-hmm. after work that lasted all night, weirdly enough. And then you just go to work the next day and all that kind of thing but what I noticed is like when I did come out and I was introduced to the gay community or queer culture even was it's not just drinking it became it was like a social event all the time Mm -hmm. it was like it wasn't the same as just going to the pub after work it was like a a connection to a community that I'd never had before. And that's that was my perception of it. And that's kind of what got me into that bubble, let's call it. So yeah. for you then, what was your, if you could pinpoint an initial point within queer culture when you were like, this is happening all the time, were you, was it quite early on or did it happen gradually? Like, When I was young, I was probably in, I'm horrible with math and timelines, but like I was in middle school to like around the time that Queer as Folk, the British, no, the the American version of Queer as Folk came on. And so I think it was that, just like watching that show and just so much of it was like them going out to the club and like drinking themselves stupid or doing crazy drugs. But, you know, from there, any other thing that I saw after that just reinforced it. I'm not saying that was the only show that glamorized that lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. They all did. But that was the first one where I watched it and they made it look sexy and hot. And I was like, I want to be like that. I want to do like all the drinking and all the drugs and have all the sex with all the hot guys. And then just like have that be my life. And none of them appeared to work. And it just seemed fabulous. So that was what I thought queer culture was. Yeah, there was for, like the British version of that was kind of something that woke me up as well to what that culture might be like going to the American one the first two seasons are exactly the same as the the British season they just remade the whole thing in exactly the same way with different people um but I love that show for all was it six seven seasons when it was done by by America um I love that show um but it did it just reinforced that that was the lifestyle that that this is the way it is and i after a couple of years of that, I didn't I didn't believe there was another option, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Because I'd never met like gay couples or groups of gay friends who didn't do that. Obviously, because we're like I was always in clubs, they were not. Like it just didn't cross my mind that there was another way that gay culture would would sit. Um but what for your realization then when you realized this is getting out of hand i'm not happy what do i have to do what was a trigger point for you when you just went this is enough i need to do something and what was it it was uh one of the things that i would black out and forget when i was drinking was my marital vows with my husband and so being caught um with my pants down literally one point and like being faced with like he's like it was a month of already not knowing what kind of person he was going to come home to but mm-hmm. that was where he was like this isn't like normal and it was but after that it was the first time where i said out loud that i can't control it like that i can't stop and be was honest with how much i was drinking because even with him someone who like lived with me i would hide so much of like the how much I was drinking when I was drinking what I was drinking from him that like he had no idea living under my roof so I think that like being able to be honest with that after keeping it a secret for so long it kind of shocked him but it also gave him a chance where he was like okay like this is not about the infidelity this is like about the the drinking and it kind of helped him realize like from there I tried my program and it worked for me thank god and like I've done done that like every 
every day pretty much ever since then so but it was it was finally being faced with my consequences i don't think even for weeks leading up to it there were so many times where i would have meltdowns even around him where like he must have like, he knew something was wrong but i wasn't saying what but it was also that he wasn't asking or i felt like he wasn't asking or it wasn't the right way but like i was giving so many warning signs to so many people around me about how miserable i was but i still didn't know how to say I was an alcoholic or that I couldn't stop or that I had a problem. I just, even now in sobriety, asking for help is something I hate doing. So the idea of like admitting I had a problem, I thought that like everyone would just be like, wow, that's too much and walk away. And so I was very afraid to share that. Everyone in the end that I shared it with was there for me and loved me and supported me. So it was all in my head, but I was crazy, like literally crazy from all the alcohol. So, yeah. Yeah. And did you... Like the program that you started, was it mm. 90 meetings in 90 days or was it a different? Yeah, I use Alcoholics Anonymous <coughs> personally. So that's the program that got me sober. But I also pretty quickly early on in recovery, because I was always an avid podcast listener and like I had a hobby podcast with my husband about movies and TV shows we okay. like. So I knew the basics of how to podcast. I was looking for more queer sober podcasts where I heard stories like mine rather than just meetings on tape almost that were podcasts and there weren't any and I knew how to make a podcast so I figured why not like make one and that's helped me so that my my program of my 12 step program is only I would say a part of my recovery. The other half has been really podcasting and cre creating a community there that okay. expands beyond just my one 12 step program, but other fellowships of 12 step programs and other like non steppy programs that like are also sober and awesome. So it's really helped expand my circle beyond just my re recovery in my rooms. That's perfect. So I was going to ask then what you mm -hmm. mentioned, like opening up to a support network. So when it came to friends and family, how well a how long does it take you to just find it in you to open up and what did you use to help you open up i told the people that needed to know at first i was not i was very surprised at the time even with no like finally admitting that i was an alcoholic i was surprised that for the next week i was pretty much having like detox symptoms where i was still going to work every day but i had like no short-term memory i was like having fevers or chills like my memory like i could not pay attention to anything so i had to confide in some of the people that i was working with what i was going through to kind of explain why i couldn't function at work for the week and like luckily they were people that trusted me that helped cover me or take care of me through the week and like knew that I would like they didn't they were again surprised that it was a problem they didn't realize which was wild with how much I was drinking on the job but um it was they were there for me and supported me like the people who needed to know know and then I made sure I waited till 90 days because I wasn't sure whether it would stick at when I first was counting days and the idea of being sober for more than 24 hours seemed impossible. So the idea of being sober for a week or a month or 90 days was, I was like, that might not even happen. So I made sure to wait to uh, come out publicly on Facebook to friends and family as an alcoholic, just to kind of like rip the bandaid. Yeah. As, and at that point I felt like I had to, cause that was also the day that I was launching my gay a show was on my 90th day sober so i was pre-recording episodes and things like that leading up to it and like promoting it on social media under its own account but i was keeping them separately so like people in my life didn't know i was posting about the sober podcast coming and it was like on the 90 days where i kind of opened them both up and like admitted that they were together and who i was and what i was doing and it's helped keep me sober i don't think i would have even made it to the 90 days if it wasn't for the podcast yeah that's perfect. So do you feel it was like a bringing both worlds together type situation because of the way you did it? And that's yeah. how, do you feel that's helped in the long run? Yeah, the the program that I work gave me the tools that I need to stop drinking and also fix myself and the reasons why I was drinking. But what the podcast did in addition was give me a certain level of public accountability that you don't get in smaller anonymous meetings sure if people in those meetings if you go out they'll welcome you back with open arms but it's a matter of a dozen people when i was even preparing for the podcast by the time it launched i had a couple hundred followers and like it's grown since then and i'm very public about my sobriety now so 
being able to have the podcast has given me a certain level of consistency and accountability that I feel like has helped. I like mentioned, I don't think I would have made it to 90 days sober because there was one day on the job, probably around 60 days, 70 days where I was so miserable and like really considering just picking up a drink because we had a liquor on my job. So I was like, I know where it is. I can just get it. Just screw all of this. Like I'm going to drink. And I checked like my Instagram on the way and someone was like, followed the show and made a comment of like, I can't wait to listen to your podcast when it comes out on 90 days. And I thought, fuck, I can't drink now. This one person wants to listen to my show when it comes out next month and I'm not going to release it if I relapse. So I can't have that drink. Yeah. And it, that wasn't the only moment over the past 200 episodes of doing the podcast that that's a moment like that's happened. But it seems like whether it's because I'm tempted to drink or whether just because I'm feeling down, that's when I seem to get those like listener messages or Godshot moments from people that just make me realize that I'm doing the right thing and that it's not just helping me stay sober, but it's helping other people, which is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. It's like an extended support network as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I've, I'll tell you why I asked this question firstly, and it's about mm -hmm. outsiders derailing recovery. Um, mm -hmm. Because every addiction that I've ever had, when I've gone cold or I've gone off and I've tried going through a program to stop, everyone or a lot of people will say, oh, but one won't hurt. Or, you know, you're going to start again at some point. Just... And that's always happened within those first 30 to 60 days where people mm -hmm. believe that you're just going to start it again anyway. So smoking, drinking, anything else. Um, oh, just, just one won't hurt. It's only, mm -hmm. it's, it's only a cigarette. It's only a drink. It's like, and it's like when I was going through that, I relapsed so many times because mm -hmm. I believed it. It's only one. But we know it's not yeah. only one. One becomes mm -hmm. a year worth. And it doesn't work like that. For So when you've got an addiction, I know when I've got an addiction, I can't even have one. I can't mm -hmm. be a social. Well, I can't do it socially. or I, can't, I just can't because it doesn't work for me. Um, so d did that happen, firstly? And what, what was your go-to to stop that happening? from other people? It's an interesting question and I love the way you worded it because when I first got sober, I had people asking me and I still meet new people every single day and it happens less and less. And so I've become more in tune with like things like mindset and all of that in my recovery. But what I've learned and experienced not only with myself, but through other people that I've, I've spoken with about this experience is that oftentimes it is very much the people around you are matching your energy or that you're vibing with something with them and they know kind of that you might want it because when I first started and oftentimes like I if I was thinking about that drink people would be asking me about that drink in a way that it doesn't happen now I go in and I say I'm sober and no one asks me questions now or if someone does it's when they pull me aside and it's more that they're sober curious or have questions about me because it brings out something in them that they're curious about but I don't get that whole oh do you want one or oh it's just one whether it's for anything anymore because I feel like I don't put that out there in the world that I'm tempted or that I'm looking for the, having that one I know that I can't have one because I can't have just the one. I've never had yeah. just the one drink. And in like sobriety, even all these years in, I'm able to laugh about it. But when I see a friend go out somewhere with me and they leave like half a glass of wine or half a drink, I'm like, what are you doing? Like, who's the crazy person here? Because you spent that money for that drink that has alcohol that can make you feel drunk and you're not drinking it. What is wrong with you? And then I remember that like the problem is me because I'm an alcoholic because that's alcoholic thinking. Yeah. But at the same same time it's when I was sober like nicotine was a struggle that I feel like I also like I'll, when I would, would quit smoking but I still wanted smoke to smoke and I was doing it because of something like a budget if someone was offering me a free one I'm like instantly the reason why I was looking to quit 
the budget wasn't in my mind at that point. All I was thinking about was how much I wanted that cigarette that that person was smoking. So when they saw me looking at them smoking the cigarette, they would offer it to me and I would say like, no, I quit. And they'd be like, are you sure it's just the one? But it's because I was putting it out there and the same way if I'm out at a bar and I'm, you know, when I was early in recovery and I was looking at someone's drink, they would be like, do you want a drink? It's just the one because they saw me fixating on it I was looking at now that I don't think about it it's not in my mind when I go out with friends I don't want to have a drink like no one offers it no one questions me anymore so I really feel like especially when we're in early recovery we're so worried about what other people are thinking about us if we just like put that out of our mind and just think about ourselves we won't attract half of those questions yeah I I did um a course when I was stopping like smoking and I was trying to stop Mm -hmm. drinking all the time and <clears throat> getting into situations I didn't want to get into. Um and I t- it was if you just don't do it, nobody will offer mm-hmm. it to you. Probably happens more regularly over here from the sounds of it that people goad you into just doing mm-hmm. it again. Um and it was just like I don't do that. That that's all I had to say. And they just never said it a second time. And I was like, Yeah. Oh, it works. Oh, so because I don't do it, I don't do that. And the minute I started saying it, nobody kept going. Nobody said it a second, third, fourth mm-hmm. time. Nobody offered again, and that was it. It just it it was perf- it was perfect for me. Um, but I mean, I've not done a recovery program. I just decided. I mean, I did a lot of self help and courses, mm-hmm. um, but I didn't do like a an addiction program. I'm an addict. My personality. Mm-hmm. I'm an addict. Um, and I have to not do anything <laughs> because of that. Mm-hmm. Because no matter what it is, whether it's drink or smoking or drugs, whatever, I become an addict. So I just can't do it. That's my problem. Yeah. Um, and even food, I'm addicted to food. I need to, I can't, I just literally, I go through life not being able to do everything to the extent I would, I'd love to do it, but I'm not going to because I don't want to be that person. I don't want yeah. to do that. I definitely have the addiction of more. Yeah. Um, but that's that's kind of just something I heard that stuck with me and it worked ever since. Um, mm. So just in case any of the listeners are thinking, well, that happens to me every time I try and stop, whether it's cigarettes or drink or like over here especially, what can I say? I mean, if you had, if you had just one thing as a response, what could you, what would you say? Oftentimes, and it's funny because when I first started, I would even say if someone's like, what can I get you a drink? I would to give them this whole talk about how sober I am and how new I am in recovery. Now I'll say I'll have a sugar free Red Bull. I'll have a water. I'll have a Heineken Zero if I'm feeling adventurous and want a non-alcoholic beer and want to make some of the other sober people uncomfortable in the room. But like I'll do something like that where. I, I'm answering their question like it does because yeah. half, half the time there again it's we're like me being the alcoholic is making it about the alcohol when they ask that question my friend is just asking me if I need another beverage to drink whether we're out so for them half the time whether they know I'm sober or not if I'm just asking for water or t- like take the drink like you're gonna yeah. you need to hydrate anyway none of us drink enough water get the water yeah that's, like that's don't perfect. make it about alcohol yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Um, so then that brings us to the podcast then, because when you started the podcast, um, you decided to make it queer focused, but like you mm-hmm. mentioned with the queer culture. Um, what was the kind of overall thought process behind that? Why did you focus solely on queer culture and making it about queer sobriety? Because all the, the the straights and like the other people already had their own podcasts uh, i learned early on with podcasting that it's better to niche down and talk specifically yeah. to the audience that you're looking to attract and i knew this goal was not only to help other queer people but to connect me with other queer people because if i was what, connecting with other sober people the type of people that i would want to connect with were my community and so i think that having that niche like all the time in podcast podcasting with my podcast clients that I coach now they're always afraid that you know they're like I want to talk to everyone about everything and I always say like you need to be as specific as possible because that way when someone looks at my cover art and sees the words sober and queer 
they're like, if that's them, they're like, that's the, that's my show. They're speaking to me because I make it very clear what it is that my show is about from the title and from the artwork. So people know what they're getting. So when they find me, they know it's a safe space for them and that they're going to be hearing stories either like theirs or for them, because it's most of the time, 99% of my episodes are queer people sharing their stories. But occasionally I have had someone who just does a lot of work in the queer community or for the queer community in recovery that have been great allies and advocates but either way it's just offering something designed for for us yeah that's perfect now it's going to sound like a bit of a weird question but Mm. my experience over here is through that lifestyle was lesbian and gay didn't have the same kind of lifestyles when it came to addictions and party lifestyle and is that do you see the same thing overseas? I find both when I have people from overseas in like the UK and beyond, as well as people in my country, the the lesbian and trans and non-binary experience is slightly different from the gay experience mm-hmm. where it seems like the, for gay men, the even in media we see it that it's more party specific focus I have plenty of lesbians, but like that share their stories, but them when they talk about it, it's more bars. And I talk with a lot more people that, you know, or have more of an issue with alcohol or occasionally like narcotics Mm -hmm. while I get, you know, for the gay community, a lot of people struggle with meth. Meth seems to be a very more gay male specific party drug. You know, other people do meth all the time. There's other people, but like in the queer community in our spectrum, if I have someone on who's in CMA or in meth addict in recovery, I can promise you they're going to be a gay man like again most of the time because it's just that seems like a very specific experience um yeah but we all have the experiences of whether it be in a bar or whether it be in a club of having society expect us to drink and a lot of us having that experience of well now that i'm sober what do i do because i don't know how to have fun or i don't know where my community is because the only community i know is in a bar or in a club or in the setting where there's alcohol everywhere so what do i do and so the show not only shares the stories of what it was like that got them to where they are but also like what they learned in sobriety about how to connect and find a new community yeah that makes sense so in the process of doing the podcast having like 200 shows over 200 shows now isn't it so yeah have you kind of decided to do any qualifications or psychology or i don't know like mental well-being qualifications to let's give you an extra string to your bow in the process I mean, it definitely has helped getting my life coaching certification in the process the last six months with being my like with my active listening, being more engaged in the interviews and being able to ask better questions. But I also learned with my coaching at one point I considered doing sober coaching and have it kind of be part of my career. And trying that out did not feel right from the moment I tried it out. It just made my recovery feel like work Mm. while my recovery is a very personal thing to me. Uh, There are so many chances that I've had to, to make more of a profit than or like business gay a, but because it is at the end of the day, like about service and helping me and other sober people stay sober, it just doesn't feel as comfortable for me. And it makes it feel like work when right now it feels like fun service. So I have my podcast, Casting business where I have other people launch podcasts like where I talk about okay. that kind of stuff for them and keep that separate and that's kind of where my coaching has drawn me was more of the podcasting side than the sober side yeah that makes sense yeah and it's good to have the awareness as well that tried that didn't work I need to move on mm-hmm. as well so in regards you mentioned mindfulness as well and I think that comes into it you're talking about life coaching so what at what point did you get into mindfulness and looking after your well-being? It was last fall. I got into a dark place where I was starting to really wonder why I was living sober. If I was still working in this job that I hated okay. and having these, you know, f- relationships like these friendships around me that didn't feel like they were supporting me or filling my needs or fueling me on or supporting me and just having the cycle of just on again like it wasn't I wasn't overtly unhappy and I wasn't ever tempted to drink or relapse necessarily but it did get to a point where I was so frustrated 
that I started actually having carpal tunnel symptoms where they were getting ready to put me into surgery for it. And I was like, why am I sober if this is what my life is like working for this awful company and doing this and doing this and doing this. And then it clicked like I was like, oh, I need to change something because like I want to live if this is my second chance at life getting sober because I know I, if I was still drinking, I would have been dead by now three years in. like there's no way I would have been alive at the reckless rate I was progressing. I would be dead. So this is my second chance at life. I want to live the life that I want to live rather than the life that I thought that I had to live because of the way that I was raised or what my parents expected for me or what is easy for my husband or my friends or my family or my bosses or people in my circle that I need to kind of look at writing out like what is my ideal life versus like where I am today and like how much of it can I adopt right away? And there was more of it that I could just kind of flip that switch if you really wanted to hard enough. And the rest, what can I start actively doing one day at a time to get towards that ideal life? And so within 30 days, I, or 30 to 60 days, like I quit my job, I enrolled in the certification program. I started this fitness journey where I've lost 70 pounds. I you know, joined a church, I joined a kickball league. I've all of a sudden like become this person, not only online where it was at first like very safe getting sober in the pandemic and having my podcast be an online space, but now also being a part of my local community as well. It's been life changing the past eight months or so since I've had that experience, just kind of evolving again, a second time in sobriety. That's perfect. So like, what was your process? Cause a lot of the listeners, like we've, we do a fitness section weirdly enough for the podcast as well. And we try and cross over between these mindfulness and fitness sides what process did you go through to continue the fitness journey as you started? Because a lot of people will try it, doesn't work, they just mm -hmm. don't like it, they don't keep it going, and they just, a month down the line, stop. What worked for you to keep you going back? The bronze, silver, gold medal system that I designed in my own head as a rewards chart. Perfect. So if I made it to the gym, I got a bronze medal for just walking into the gym. And if I made it like a half an hour doing cardio, I got a silver medal. And if I did it like cardio and weights for like a total of an hour, I got a gold medal. And then after like 30 days, it like I increased the time. So I had to be there longer to get my gold medal each time. But I wanted my gold medal every single day. And by the time that it happened, like, and again, being an addict, this was one time where like once it became a habit and I realized that working out feels good and I get all these like endorphins and dopamine and all these things running through me and I feel strong and powerful and cool. Like I'm like addicted to that feeling now or now it's like I want I wake up every morning excited to go to the gym for my workout routine but it all started at first when I was dreading it just wanting to get my gold silver or bronze medal for the day knowing I would nine out of ten times get a gold because that's how I roll that's perfect now that is a great motivation especially when you designed it yourself for those of you listening it does not feel good to start with. <laughs> Keep mm -hmm. going because further down the line, it always gets better and it starts mm -hmm. to become a habit. Perfect way to get it, get that in as well. Um, mm -hmm. What's your favorite thing about fitness? What, which, what exercise do you prefer? Exercises, I love doing upper body, especially like preacher curls are my favorite right now at the gym, but it's mostly doing weights because so much of my fitness journey at first was fixated on trying to lose weight that when I switched to incorporating more weight training into it is when I started like, it was again, like another layer where I not only was feeling more, like I had more endurance, but I also had, I was just getting stronger and having more definition in my body. So that was exciting. So yeah, definitely the, the weight training. And did you um, change your nutrition at the same time or did you do it in stages? I did it in stages uh, and it still goes in stages. I've been kinder to myself with nutrition, but right now I like, we just, m my friend and I like grilled so many chicken breasts for the week to get our proteins. So we are doing better with our diet or trying for this month because we're getting ready. They have out Viver, which is like gay survivor camping in the woods okay. uh, at Labor Day weekends where like, we want to get like ready for that. So we're like, this will give us like two to three months to get like ready for out Viver. So is that a weekend away or is it something you you do over? It's like a two to three months away. So it's a four day experience where it's oh, wow. four days of challenges. And then we like have a camping where we're not out in the woods sleeping like on Survivor. Wow. We have cabins, but we'll have cabins, food, but then it's four days of challenges. That sounds so cool. I wouldn't like yeah. the camping because I don't like camping. But the challenges I've never I done love it before, the sound of challenges. Yeah. 
Yeah. You've never been camping? Never been camping. But again, I'm my new thing is now like I'll try anything. And just if it doesn't sound like it's going to put me immediately in life or death danger, why not try it? Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. I don't like it because I tried it. It wasn't for me. I love a glamping trip. But, yeah. <laughs> but not a tent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, we have our mattresses all there ready for us. We just oh, have to perfect. bring the bed sheets. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so then you mentioned having a friend that you go to the gym with as well. So in regards mm-hmm. to your support network, how has it changed over the progression of when you started needing support? now i would say when i first started my support network i had to rely a lot on my husband and the home group that i got sober in was on zoom and new york city based so i found myself even traveling up to new york city to have some time in person with them a couple times a year through it so but it was mostly virtual because it was during the pandemic and I kept that when the world opened back up again and i stayed isolated with my little sober community online where most of my friends were virtual outside of my work and then my senior living industry that I was working in at the time. And I just was was isolating. So it was when I, it's like last November, December, when I started opening up and joining local things that now I also have not only more sober friends locally, but also I have non-sober people that, you know, we call them normies, but like what, or I call them normies at least, but like I have people that don't practice sobriety that I'm friends with and close with. And they respect my sobriety. I respect them when they drink because if they can drink and not be an alcoholic, cool, good for them. That's not my story, but that's yeah. doesn't mean that that's their story. Like I keep that separated. We're very bit like in the programs, like very big on like attraction, not promotion. People know I'm here if they need help with sobriety, but if they want to like have a hot girl summer, I'm not going to be the one judging them with my sunglasses. Like you go have that if you're not waking up in the morning wanting to die and regretting the cycle and needing some help. Like other than that, you go do you. Yeah, that's great. So I was going to ask then, you mentioned going to New York and you're based in mm-hmm. Florida. Mm-hmm. What? How long is that for a journey? It was like a three to four hour flight. Okay. It's a process getting up there. It was definitely something that I just did a couple times a year. Now it's something that I'm not going up there again until next September. And that's because I'm helping create a program for a roundup. So it'll be four days of workshops or three days of workshops and speakers that are helping organize in New York City and Times Square. Oh, that's great. And you mentioned you were, were you sober during lockdown as well, the pandemic? That's when I got sober. It was like the world shut down. And while it was shut down, I was drinking all that I want working from home and that's when things got really bad and i got sober before things opened up again so wow what a time to do march 28th of 2021 when yeah you couldn't really do in-person meetings you had to do online but it connected me i feel like when i first started i needed to find like a group of young people in my age group that were rainbow and queer and diverse and had different skin colors and used different gender expressions. And I was not going to find that here in Florida. I, if I went to my first meeting and saw that it was a whole bunch of old white men talking about how good it was back in the day, I would have like turned tail and gone back out again. So I'm very glad that the pandemic led to more Zoom meetings, which led to me being able to find access to rooms that looked like me when I got sober. Now I can go to any meeting at all and get the message because like I understand that you're there to identify with the feelings that you we all share together rather than comparing what's different about us yeah. but I didn't know how to do that at first I just saw a bunch of people that look not my people great decision yeah <laughs> great decision so tell us a bit about Florida then what's it like mm-hmm. Florida I've never been what's it like yeah it's hot. Mo- like, I mean, right now over the summer we're recording. So I'm very glad that air conditioning is a thing. Um, but I enjoy where I live in Sarasota specifically on the Sun Coast because we do, it is a little cooler because we get the breeze from the water. I'm 10 to 15 minutes away from some amazing beaches. I have a nice queer community here uh, that you have to find. But once you find it, like it exists, like I have a church that's very queer friendly. I have a queer kickball league. I have like friends and my family's here. My husband's family's here. So we have like a life here. There's a good amount of pride things and performing arts and festivals and 
were like formerly a circus town. So there's a lot of like circus things here, which has been kind of fun. Um, I wish we had more of an active and awesome drag scene, like some of the other bigger cities like Orlando and we don't, but one day who knows maybe but yeah i like it because i'm in a nice part of sarasota when you're in like bigger cities like sarasota st pete tampa orlando okay. it becomes a little more like you're more up north where it's a little more like liberal than the more north you go in florida the more south it feels you get as you get closer to the state line and it feels more like you feel those out of tune banjos going on in the background you're like oh no am i safe i don't go up there oh brilliant so have you had much going on for pride month Yes, pretty much every weekend has been something between here in Sarasota as Got well it. as up in St. Pete that I am partied out and I am sure half of my friend group is going to be sick next week or the week after that as we all just rest because we are tired. Even last night at Drag Queen Bingo, the drag queen, perf one of the drag queens performing, I swear she was half asleep. You could tell these <laughs> girls are tired and they need to sleep. So I, yes, we all did a very good, very active, very happening Pride Month and we're all ready to hibernate for Amazing. a week or two while all the straights deal with their fourth of july nonsense isn't it yeah but at least girls are getting paid i tell you <laughs> yeah um okay so if any of us want to go to florida for the first time what would you recommend for an authentic experience do like a beach day where all you do is just go to the beach okay. and yeah be prepared to spend most of the day at the beach maybe leave a little bit to get food nearby somewhere and come back but just do a day at the beach and relax because that's when we're at our best isn't when we're not running at a million miles an hour but when we're taking care of ourselves or also like work in like a spa day but the self-help and self-care down here at least in my area in sarasota there's a lot of sound healing and metaphysical stuff salt caves there's a lot of ways to take care of yourself here so just take a day taking care of yourself here and at the beach and do you do that yourself throughout the year at the weekends mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's perfect i definitely try at least like once a month to do something that's care related refill my cup yeah and do you do meditations or anything Oh, I look out when I got sober and started my 12 step program, my husband decided that he was into like witchcraft and metaphysics and Reiki Perfect. and healing and spirituality. So he does a full moon ceremony once a month I get to participate in where we have a guided meditation and then I release what's no longer serving me a couple times a week. He does practice Reiki on me and I like that. So I got, yeah, I got all of that kind of stuff from him all built in with the package. We love it. Love spirituality. And it's so mm -hmm. great to release each month. Just yeah, get rid, get rid. Mm -hmm. Love mm -hmm. it. Exactly. Um, okay, so tell us, where can we find, where can our listeners find your podcast? What is the website? What's your links? Where can we find you? Yeah, the easiest way is SoberSteve.com. I always say if you're looking specifically for Gay A, I learned after I made the show and like a year into it that Gay A is the worst search engine optimization name you could ever choose for anything ever because all it is to the internet computer that reads it is a gay basically. So when you're trying to find my podcast, I'm finding it's every single person that has the words A <laughs> and gay in their show. It's insane. You'll never find me just searching Gay A. Search queer sober and I'll pop up right away in your podcasting apps. Hopefully you'll link over into show notes too. But yeah, SoberSteve.com is also a very easy way to find all of my stuff. Perfect. And any plans to release a book or an audiobook or anything from what you've done? I don't know about that. I know that right now I'm just focused on growing the podcast. Uh, we just recently passed the 200 episodes. So I'm at the point now where I'm no longer guest hunting. Guests are finding me and asking to be on, which is a really good feeling. So I'm just kind of riding the momentum while I'm trying to grow my other show, my podcasting badass channel, just to get that going. That's perfect. Well, keep us posted if you do decide to expand any further. And we'll yes. let everyone know. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, well, Steve, it's been a great chat. Thank you again for coming to spend time with us. And thank you guys all for listening and tuning in to this episode of Mamwa. Do not forget to drop us a comment and keep the conversation going. You can subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss a thing and stay tuned for future episodes. Also, follow us on Facebook at GordyCamp TV and at GordyCamp on Instagram and threads. Until next time, look after yourselves and whatever you're going through, Remember that you do have support available when you need it. Be well, stay strong, and stay healthy.
See you soon. Bye.